Hello, welcome to this introduction to LTI Advantage. Uh, today we're going to cover uh, a brief introduction to LTI and LTI Advantage. Um, after that, we'll cover uh, security and registration, then how to do LTI launches, and then finally, how to use LTI services. Um, so what is LTI? LTI stands for Learning Tools Interoperability. Uh, at a high level, it's a, a standard way to seamlessly integrate web applications in the browser and to utilize a common API infrastructure. This allows a platform to host many integrations with low to no overhead per partner. Um, and platform is an important uh, keyword to remember, as is tool. A tool or a learning tool or a content provider um, can embed inside a platform with little custom work as well. So that's really the big advantage of LTI, is integrating uh, platforms and tools. Um, when you do an LTI integration, an LTI integration provides a single sign-on mechanism with context and user information, and we'll cover that a little bit more. So as a quick explanation or example, uh, say you have an LMS. Uh, an LMS through this presentation is what we will uh, consistently use as an example of a platform, though other things can also be platforms. So say you have an LMS that has a couple lessons in it, um, including uh, this reading 1.1, which is an LTI link. When a learner clicks this link, the typical flow is that the vendor content behind that LTI link replaces the content inside the LMS. It is embedded uh, such that the learner doesn't even necessarily understand uh, where the content's coming from. It's meant to be a seamless experience to keep it nice and simple for um, everyone using it. And that's what we call an LTI launch, or sometimes we'll call those LTI messages. Um, so it's important vocabulary to remember throughout this. And then there are also API services. And a service is between a platform and a tool, uh, usually not involving the browser as the LTI launch does, and services, uh, we'll dive much deeper into these later, but for example, they allow a tool to request the roster for a given course um, or create new line items, which are assignments in a course. Um, and it really allows for very deep integrations in a standardized way. So what's the information that's sent on every single LTI launch? Um, so as you saw in the last example, when we showed that vendor content within the LMS, when the LMS loaded that vendor content, it sent which LMS it was. That can be useful for some custom integrations sometimes. There's an identifier for who the school is or who the customer is. Uh, context information, uh, is, that is often a course, a consistent course ID is sent and the course's name, though it doesn't have to be a course, it can be other context as well. Um, often very important is the user information, along with consistent IDs for that user, uh, a name and email can be sent if it's configured that way. But it's also up to the platform provider to decide how much uh, personal identifying information to send um, or not to send on LTI integrations. But once you have it configured and set up with your platform, it will be consistent through all of your launches. Um, the role of the user is also sent, and that can be very important for many different uh, tools as well. Another item sent is called is the message type. So we have an LTI launch or an LTI message. And the type of that message can be very significant. Typically, it's just a message that's saying, hey, I want to load content or load this tool. But there's also one for discovering content and other extension ones. Um, so those are the, the primary data that are sent, um, although there's much, much more as well. And the, the launch information is generally highly configurable within the platform. So tools can get what they need and can create flexible integrations. Uh, so that's kind of, that was the messaging side of it and the data that's sent there. The other side is the service infrastructure, which I referenced briefly before. So the services are built on top of industry standards, uh, primarily OAuth 2 and OpenID. This is excellent because many developers are already familiar with both of those standards and there are many libraries uh, that implement those as well. So there's a lot of uh, knowledge and infrastructure reuse that can be uh, reused for implementing LTI. Um, also, the APIs can, are, can be quite flexible. They, have, they can have scope for granular permissions um, and other things like that. And also, the whole infrastructure is very extensible, both for LTI launches and messages and for creating new services as well. 
Um, and so that really can help foster a great community of solving problems on a common infrastructure. So that message that, that em for embedding content inside of the platform is what we call the core part of LTI. So that's LTI 1.3 core. What LTI Advantage is, it's that core implementation along with the supplementary services or extension services that we call deep linking, names and roles, and assignments and grades. And so LTI Advantage is a combination of implementing these four specifications, LTI 1.3 and those services. And I'll go through each of those services now. The first one is deep linking. Deep linking is really a uh, user interface flow in the browser for content discovery. In the past, uh, if you wanted to get an LTI link into an LMS, uh, you would often have someone copying and pasting a URL and a title or importing a common cartridge or uh, 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 many other manual ways. Deep linking provides a flow for this that makes it so much easier um, for your customers. So let's say you have a full course structure inside your LMS already, and you've got these three modules, each with two LTI links. But you want to add, a, you're missing an LTI link for a resource that you want. Um, and what you, what you do is you load a deep linking LTI message. And what that is, is you launch into your content vendor, and it passes all of the LTI information that we talked about. And generally what a content vendor might care about is that they're a teacher in this course for the school. And then the vendor can you know, customize their search UI for that user to things they already, you know, maybe showing their favorites or showing what you know, their, their school's registered for or what this individual teacher or this course is registered for. You know, there's a lot of options with the data that you get to allow a nice search interface for the, the teacher or the course designer. Um, and uh, typically what will happen is they will search, they will find an item or multiple items and then once they're done there they click finish and that LTI information is returned to the platform and the platform is able to embed that within the course um, and since it's such a nice easy flow and they don't really have to go into different contexts to find content discovery everyone's very excited and feels like a champion so <clears throat> the next service let's talk about is rostering and for this, I'm going to draw a little bit of a comparison to LTI 1.1. LTI 1.1 is very broadly implemented in the marketplace, and so there's a lot of people very familiar with it. And uh, this rostering was one of a, uh, was a common complaint with LTI 1.1. And how it worked was, say you're on a platform and you have a course with three students, a tool can't know what students are in a course until each student individually clicks a link and does an LTI launch into the tool. And as each student comes, the tool can build up their version of the roster and see those, but they don't know if they're missing. They don't know if a student leaves the course or if new students come. So um, while it was you know, a very great foundation for building these integrations, uh, there was uh, a lot of features that people wanted. So let's contrast that with the new names and role service uh, that's part of LTI Advantage. Names and roles allows a tool to just request a roster from the platform for a course. And the platform can just return a paginated roster, and then the tool has the whole roster for that moment. Um, that provides a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of use cases that are great for this. Um, but also, it, it allows for things like, say, a new student was added to the course. Um, you can wait for the student to click a link and find out who they are the same old way. Um, but a tool, you know, say they're going to, they're doing some housekeeping, they could do a request and say, hey, is there anything new since yesterday or since this timestamp? And then the platform can just return a delta of what was new. You know, that could be added users, removed users, or changed roles. And all the information that's returned in this API response is the same data that's passed in an LTI launch. Um, you know, so that context, that, that role, the IDs, all of that comes along in the same uh, service. And so it allows you to be a lot more flexible than you could be before. And so uh, I highly recommend uh, if you have needs of rosters, upgrade to LTI Advantage. It will really help you. So the next service is the names, uh, is the grading service. And again, I want to contrast this to LTI 1.1. Uh, in LTI 1.1, if you wanted to have uh, 
an LTI assessment or anything that had a grade associated with it, you kind of had to set up your LMS first. You had to go in there, you had to make sure you had your line item or your grade column in there and that that grade column was tied to your LTI link within the LMS. And all this kind of happened outside the scope of what LTI was capable of seeing or dealing with. And so there were often many problems where uh, in an LMS you might have an LTI link without a grade column or a grade column without an LTI link and it could kind of be very hectic and it was the tool couldn't do anything other than you know email teachers to help them figure it out or open up support tickets stuff like that. Um, and so just the setup was very difficult in LTI 1.1. Um, and then on top of that, the way you would actually get a grade back in the grade book is when a student would come over to the tool, they would pass an ID that was for their specific grade cell. So it was this student for this assessment, and this is an ID. Then inside the tool, they would take the quiz and the grade would come back. The tool would say, hey, LMS, here's the score for this ID. It was 88%. Um, and uh, it would uh, populate the grade book. But let's say the student stayed in the tool, went to another activity, finished that, and the tool wanted to send that grade back to the platform. The tool cannot do that in LTI 1.1 because they do not have the ID from that student doing an LTI launch for that grade. So that's just not possible in LTI 1. You uh, have to wait for the student to go back and click that link to get an ID to then use that to write a grade back. And that's just not flexible enough for, most, for many people's needs. Um, and it caused a bunch of other uh, integration problems as well. So the new assignments and grade service uh, really helps with both of these problems, both of provisioning line items and assessments and uh, doing grades, managing the actual grades and scores. So how does that work? If you're making use of assignments and grade service, you as a tool don't even have to go set up anything in the platform at the beginning. You know, you don't have to have your grades and links set up. You can, and sometimes that's nice, you know, to pre-populate that with a common cartridge or something to you. It's there as soon as the teacher's there. But um, you can also use this service, and with this, you can create a quiz that is tied to your LTI link just via assignments and grades API. So you can say, hey, add this quiz. And not just that, it gives you the ability to edit your quizzes. You can change it to 10 points possible. Um, you could go check all the line items that you have. Maybe you don't know, maybe someone course did a course copy and you're not quite sure how that course is all set up. So you could go fetch all those line items. You can also delete your quizzes um, and manage all of them in that way. So it provides a lot of flexibility for um, creating your assignments and making sure they're tied to the right items. Um, and then for writing grades back, let's say you have your, it's all set up um, with science and grades, it can work the same way as LTI 1.1, where a student comes across and says, hey, here's my ID for grading activity X, and you can send that grade back and it goes back. But now, if they go on to another part of your tool um, and generate another grade, you can also send that grade back because you have the information needed. Uh, to send that grade back because you either you created it yourself or you're able to fetch all the possibilities and so you can send back a second grade. Um, and there's also a few new features on top of just pure scores and grades going back. You can mark uh, your grade with different properties. For example, a common one is let's say uh, it's an essay and a teacher has to come in and grade the essay for it to work. You can send back a message to LMS and say, hey, this needs grading. And then the teacher could see that notice in their LMS gradebook potentially and go, oh, I need to go to that tool and actually do my grading. Um, you can also fetch the grades um, uh, that you've sent and, and see those, those final grades there. So that's an overview of LTI Advantage. Uh, it, again, Advantage is a combination of four specifications. The LTI 1.3 core implementation, and on top of that, you can implement deep linking, names and roles, and assignments and grades. Uh, finally, uh, for this segment, uh, there's a lot of great resources out there for learning LTI and implementing LTI. The primary one is the LTI project page itself. Um, this can be found on the IMS website under the developers tab, and you just go to learning tools interoperability in there. And in here are the actual links to the specification itself, each of these services, assignments and grades, names and roles, deep linking, um, and lots of other learning resources. Some of these uh, I will mention again in later parts of this video.
Now we'll start to cover uh, the security and registration models for LTA 1.3 and its services. Uh, again, we'll draw a comparison to LTA 1.1 since that's familiar with many people. And uh, in LTA 1.1, uh, the, the core security mechanism was a shared key and secret. A tool would generally provide that to the platform and they would sign their messages using that shared secret. Uh, in LTI 1.3, uh, we've moved on to a model of public and private key pairs. This really increases the uh, security of the messages themselves, but also allows each side of the relationship to provide their own uh, security keys, and uh, are, they're also able to rotate those over time uh, much easier than they could before. So there's a lot of great improvements there. Um, and then uh, we've also separated the concept of register and deploy, and I'll explain this uh, in, in the upcoming slides here. And so there's a lot of new advantages to uh, LTI 1.3 and improvements in the security model. Um, so uh, again, this is the LTI 1.1 registration. The tool provides the key and secret, and once the admin configures it, the tool immediately becomes available. Uh, for that platform and that customer. There's just one action, you register, the tool's available. Uh, for 1.3, we kind of threw out that model and we kind of split it. So instead of having just a platform or customer, we kind of split the concept to a platform is separate from a school or a customer. And, um, and the registration happens at the tool and the platform level. So this is, uh, I, I like to think of this as the um, security information, the security contract is between the vendors, the tool and the platform, and not between every single customer and the tool. Um, and so there's a lot less overhead for setting up the security uh, for many different customers. Um, and there's also a, a configuration for OIDC, which we'll cover in a bit as well. Um, and once the tool registers the platform, the platform provides to the tool two very important uh, pieces of data to remember. We will be mentioning this very frequently during the rest of this presentation. That is the issuer and the client ID. The issuer is the platform's core ID. When a tool thinks about a platform and wants to do something with the platform, it needs to know the issuer. And then when a tool uh, registers with a platform, the platform provides the tool a client ID. And so a tool, when it's requesting tokens and stuff from the platform, always has to provide its client ID. So those are two uh, very important pieces of data to remember. And so that's the security contract. And once a tool has created a security contract with a platform, they can then deploy to a school or a customer within that platform. Um, and generally that is done by the tool providing the client ID to their customer. And now that LMS admin, whereas before in LTI 1, they had to copy and paste both the key and the secret and the URLs. Um, now all they have to paste is this client ID because all of that, those, those URLs and the security contract, all that configuration was done before it got to the school or the customer, you know, the actual LMS admin. Uh, and so it makes it a, a simpler model. And once a LMS admin create, enables an integration inside their platform, a deployment ID is created. And that customer can provide that deployment ID to a tool. And the deployment ID is how a tool will identify their customer. And so let's see what this kind of looks like. Oh, and um, the LMS admin can also generally will have the ability at that point to enable a tool or disable it, and then it becomes available. So the core thing to recognize here is the separation of registration and deployment. So uh, a tool registers with the platform then it deploys to a customer. And then if that tool has three more customers at that platform on that specific LMS, cloud hosted LMS, for example, they don't have the tool doesn't have to register again for each of those they get to deploy separately with each of those again sharing that security contract from before and that's a much simpler model for uh, a learning tools customers um, but not all platforms are multi-tenant uh, this is called the multi-tenant model uh, many of them are just on a single tenant platform either because they're hosting it themselves or the LMS doesn't support multi-tenancy in this case a tool 
still registers and deploys. They're still, the concepts are still separate, but it just happens that they happen at the same time at the same place often. And so your data model uh, is consistent uh, regardless of whether you're using a multi-tenant platform or a single tenant platform. But if you're working with customers on a single tenant platform, you might want your instructions to be a bit different than they would be for your multi-tenant platforms that you support. Um, and for each single tenant platform that you uh, add support for, you have to register and deploy for each separate customer versus the multi-tenant one where you only have to register once and then you just deploy for each customer. Um, so this is a definitely a different model, but there's a lot of advantages to the security contract being between the vendors and it can really reduce the attention uh, needed uh, by your customers to actually get these things set up. So at registration time, uh, there's a lot of uh, data that's exchanged between the two, um, between the platform and the tool. Uh, a platform provides to the tool, the tool's client ID, uh, its issuer ID, that's the platform's issuer ID, the JWKS URL, that is the URL that has all of the uh, URLs, the, the IDs and URLs for um, the public keys that the platform might use to sign LTI launches going over to the tool provider. Um, and then these will cover more later when we're actually talking about LTI launches. An OAuth uh, token endpoint and an OIDC auth request endpoint. We'll, so just I'll reference those multiple times when we go to LTI launch. Um, and then a tool provides to a platform the domains that it's active for. This allows a platform to match LTI launch URLs to a specific tool provider if a client ID isn't present. The tool can provide its own JWKS URL for all of its uh, public keys. Uh, this is not a required part of the specification. Um, and so uh, not all tool providers do that at this point, um, but it's becoming the more, the more standard way to do it in practice because of the uh, security benefits and key rotation benefits. And the simplicity it has compared to having to copy and paste uh, your public keys into platforms at registration time. And then the tool also provides two URLs or a URL and a set of URLs, the login initiation URL and the redirect URLs. And so we'll cover those in much more depth later. Um, for registration, uh, the LTI work group uh, monthly help holds what we call LTR member round tables. And these are excellent presentations on various topics around LTI. And uh, this year in April, there was an excellent one that uh, showed the registration process for D2L, Canvas, Blackboard, and Moodle. And so if you're looking to integrate those platforms, I highly recommend seeking out this roundtable video and seeing what the process actually looks like. Um, and uh, just to cover that again, this is the LTI project page, and there's a link to all the roundtables right here at the top of this page. And this is what the roundtable uh, archive looks like. So you just find the April 28th one and click that and it takes you to YouTube and you can watch that video. So if you're looking to integrate into some of those LMSs, that's a great resource for um, seeing what that process actually looks like so you can start to prepare for it. Now let's talk about LTI launches in a bit more depth. As I mentioned earlier, uh, LTI 1.3 is built on top of OpenID Connect, often just abbreviated as OIDC, and so you'll see that a lot. OIDC is an identity layer on top of OAuth 2. OIDC adds end user authentication, uh, describes some security and privacy considerations, a um, bunch of other things like that. Uh, in OpenID, uh, one of the core pieces to remember is called an ID token. So I'll be referencing ID token very frequently for the rest of this presentation. So remember ID token. What an ID token is, is just a JWT that is signed uh, with a JSON web signature. Um, and we'll cover how that works a little bit later. Um, within each of these tokens, and we'll break those down in a second, uh, uh, LTI adds some custom claims. Claims is another important vocabulary word. Uh, every new property we add to the LTI launch information is under a claim. Those are the, the properties of the messages. Um, and so uh, LTI builds on top of what OIDC already provides. Um, another, you know, common parlance that people just use, instead of saying ID token, we'll often say the LTI message um, and things like that. 
So uh, um, ID token is important to remember, so is LTI message, but um, sometimes we kind of uh, use those pretty loosely. So what is in an ID token? An ID token is split up into three parts, the header, the message, and the signature. All, all of them contain very important information. So in the header is the kid or the key ID. When uh, the platform signs the ID token, it signs it with its private key, and then it puts the key ID of the public key inside the header. So when the tool receives this message and wants to validate the ID token, it looks at the key ID, goes to its uh, JWKS, the, the, the URL that lists all the public keys for the platform, finds the one with that key, gets that public key, and that's what it will actually use to validate the signature, which is the last section here. So the signature is a section that uh, signs the, the rest of the message and puts the signature down in this little block. And again, as this emphasizes here, that it's signed with the private key of the platform and verified, verified with the public key of the platform. Uh, separate from those is the main body of the token, uh, the message area. Um, OIDC has a couple primary pieces there, the issuer and the audience. Um, and I'll cover those more in, in the LTI context on the next slide. So this is kind of high level. This is what an ID token, this is what and the data that's contained in an LTI launch message. Uh, so on top of this core OIDC concept of the ID token, LTI adds some data. So, well, first of all, so the issuer in the LTI context is the uh, issuer of the platform. So if you remember at registration time, uh, the platform gave the tool uh, its issuer and also the client ID of the tool. And so that's important because the audience, this next item here, is the client ID of the tool. Um, and so those are important information that come across in every single LTI launch, and it's important to uh, get those, that data in the right place there. The next one's very important as well. This is the sub or the subject. This is the user making the request. And this ID is unique within every single issuer. So you won't see the same subject ID uh, for different users within the same issuer. Uh, in LTI 1.1, the core ID that uh, identified an LTI user was the user ID, and the subject plays the same role as a user ID in LTI 1.1. If you go and compare the other properties between LTI 1.1 and 1.3, most of them have the same or similar names, and it's pretty, pretty easy to map them. Uh, because we adopted OIDC, uh, we converted this we're using subject instead of user ID. So that's a very important one to just remember if you're upgrading that user ID is now the value in subject inside the ID token. A couple more claims, again, each new data, each of these is called a claim uh, inside uh, that LTI adds to the ID token is the deployment ID. Uh, this, is, this identifies the customer for the tool as we talked about in the registration section. Um, the message type, uh, this is, you know, whether it's a core message or whether it's a deep linking message and other extension ones. So it's an important one to, you know, it's the, the tool may want to key off of the message type for what it's going to do uh, with this request. And then there, uh, the, uh, the, the next most important ones are the service definition claims that we'll cover later. But every LTI launch that supports LTI services will also send a claim with information about the services that it supports. So uh, in LTI 1, when you did an LTI launch, you would always go right to the, the tool from the platform. Uh, with OIDC, this becomes a two-leg launch. And what that means is uh, it's kind of, there's, there's two legs. <laughs> so uh, I, I, the, instead of just one step, we're going to break each of these down. But I just want to try to get the high level uh, concept here. Uh, there's there's a first part where a platform goes to, goes to a tool and says, "Hey, I want to do an LTI launch," and this provides the tool the opportunity to set a cookie for the platform. Again, we'll go into more detail on this uh, to uh, to work around some secure, potential security problems. And then after they do that little handshake, uh, then they can actually do the LTI launch as the second leg of the LTI launch. And we'll we'll get into that. Um, but this causes a lot of confusion uh, in 
uh, Delta Advantage world. Um, and there's a kind of a lot of there's a lot of names that people call these different things. <laughs> so uh, I put a couple of them on here, but again, it's, there's two sections to an LTA launch. The first one is we often call you know the first leg of login, the first leg of the LTA launch, or just the first part. Officially, it's called the OIDC login initiation request and the authentication request. Um, but just kind of you know remember the first leg, the first part often means the the first the next slide we're going to talk about, and then after that uh, is the authentication response. And we often just say you know the actual LTI launch, the second leg of the LTI launch, or the second part. Um, and so really that's that's my main uh, emphasis I want to get on this part is you know there's sometimes when we're talking about each of these legs, uh, people can talk past each other and it can be a little bit confusing. So uh, let's actually look at what those look like. So this is the first leg that we're talking about. Uh, this is the initiation and the auth request. And so what happens is uh, a user clicks an LTI link in the browser and that goes to the platform. The platform redirects to the initiation login URI. This is information that is exchanged at registration time and it's the, the tool only provides one of these. So a tool that is implementing LTI will always get uh, for a given registration, uh, they will always do the first leg of this to the exact same URL and it's never, any, it's never different. And it can be a get or a post, that's a little gotcha. Um, and on this, there's not that much information sent. This isn't signed, this doesn't have any personal identifying information, doesn't have any security information, uh, stuff like that. So it, all it has is the issuer, so the tool can know what platform is sending this. The target link URI, this is the URI of the resource that they're hoping to load after the second leg. Um, and then optionally, the platform can provide a login hint. Uh, and this is just an opaque value that the tool doesn't look at and the tool sends it back to the platform. Um, and this is so when, the, when it comes back to the platform, the platform could grab this and you know, verify that they're going to the, the same target link URI that they're planning to or other, you know, some user information. It's really a tool for the platform to make sure it knows all the data it needs. So the tool gets this. And then the key part of this is when the tool redirects back to the platform, uh, which uses the platform's OIDC auth request endpoint, that's another piece of data that was exchanged at registration time, and it's always the same for a registration, the tool needs to set a state cookie in the browser. And this is to verify that the it's the same browser that started this process is the same one that finishes it at the end. And that's one of the, the primary security uh, um, updates to using the OIDC flow instead of the previous 1.1 LTI launch mechanism. So that, that state cookie is very important. And so the tool passes that state and some other information back to the platform. So that information uh, is just kind of standard OIDC information, uh, like the scope and the response type here. Uh, they will always say open ID and ID token. Um, the, the client ID, the tool passes its own client ID uh, that it got during registration. The redirect URI, uh, and we'll, we'll cover this again later, but at registration time, the tool provided a list of redirect URIs, and those are the actual end launch URLs that we'll go to, and we'll, we'll do that in the next slide. Uh, the tool provides a nonce, which is just a, a, a value that um, it's going to verify on the last leg as well to make sure no one is replaying the same launch twice. Um, the state, and that is that state is the same value that it set in the cookie, and it will use that later to validate. And then if the platform had passed the login hint on the first step or this other, uh, another optional one called LTI message hint, the tool must pass those back on this first leg of this. So this is still just the first leg of the hop uh, of the LTI launch. Um, it's the OIDC init login initiation and the tool auth request. So now we're on to the second leg. That top bar is everything we just talked about. It's the login initiation, auth authentication request. And once the platform receives that authentication request with all that data in it, again, that's the, the scope and the client ID and the redirect URIs, it, the platform has a little bit of validation to do. First of all, it needs to make sure the current user is logged in. Um, they probably are because they started here in the platform. But you know, they check they're logged in, that they're enrolled in the course that this link is in, that they have permissions for that link, you know, all of its normal platform validations for this user and the scope of that link. 
uh, you know, and it might use the login hint that it sent over uh, to to verify that to know which user it is. Um, you know, it's, it's up to the platform and what what their needs are for implementing that. It needs to validate that the redirect URI the tool has returned in that first leg is one of the redirect URIs that was provided during registration. This is to prevent some tool from trying to uh, get the platform to launch to a different URL uh, that the tool doesn't own or someone trying to trick them. So at registration time determines the only valid places that an LTI launch will actually happen, and that is the list of redirect URIs. Uh, the platform also needs to verify the scope is present and that it's just open ID. Uh, and then the platform will generate the ID token or the LTI message itself. So that's the signed JWT with all the important data needed for the tool to operate. So at this point, the platform has validated the, the, the first leg of the flow and has generated its ID token. And then it does an auto posting form. This is very similar to LTI 1. Uh, LTI 1.1 was just a, a post, an auto posted form that had a bunch of uh, data in it. This one's a little bit simpler. All it has is primarily two fields, the state, which is what the tool provided uh, in the last slide along the first leg, the same value that's supposed to be in the cookie, and the ID token, which is what it just, it just generated in this last step. Um, and so it posts to the redirect URI, um, and then the tool does its own validation. And make sure that the state passed in the post message it just got is the same state as the cookie in the browser, the, the cookie in the browser, um, so that you know this this someone can trick someone else to log in for them as an LTI launch. And then it has to validate the ID token. There's a bunch of documentation in the OIDC for how to validate that and all the the different pieces involved in that. Um, a, a key piece is that it may require fetching the the public keys from the platform using the J JWKS URI and then using the KID, the kid, uh, inside the ID token to find the right public key to use to validate that. And this is all done in JWT libraries. It's pretty easy to implement. And then once the tool has validated all the information, it just displays the content uh, to the user or it redirects the user to the content, you know, whatever, whatever it needs to do. So to combine these last two slides together, uh, this is the whole flow we just went through. There's a lot, of, a lot of arrows here. It can be quite confusing. You can see why a lot of people talk past each other. Um, so uh, while you don't necessarily have to know all the right vocabulary for all this, if you're having problems with something and trying to communicate with someone, it can be useful to make sure you know the names of the various stages of this. And you know, if you're using, an OIDC uh, library in your implementation. It might use the OIDC vocabulary. So let's uh, just do a little review here. The first part of this, when a user clicks the LTI link, is called the login initiation request. The platform says, hey tool, I want to send a user to you. And the tool on the second leg says, cool, I want you to send a user to me too. And that's called the authorization request. So the tool says, okay, platform, Here's the data you need to know to actually do an LTI launch, um, you know, and it sets the state cookie. And then the final part is the actual the authorization response. And this is what you know we again call often. That's the actual LTI launch. That's the second part. Um, the, you know, it, there's a lot of different ways people reference this, but these are the the vocabulary you might need when you're trying to implement this and communicate with people. So that is a fairly complicated flow, uh, but as you break it down and, and work at it, and there's lots of great library support out there, uh, um, it shouldn't slow you down too much. Um, one last little piece here uh, with the launch URL. So just a review here to help people not get caught up on this. In LTI 1.1, uh, it was common that every single resource you accessed had its own custom URL. So it was like tool assignment one or tool assignment 56. And when you actually did the LTI launch, it would be to the endpoint that was provided in that launch URL. In LTI 1.3, that's not how it works. You know, you have a set list of redirect URIs, which are the values, the valid values that are allowed to happen for that last leg for this authorization response leg of this. Um, and so it will always go to the same URIs. 
how then do you specify the specific resource that you would like to load? The preferred way is that when you create that LTI link via deep linking or comma cartridge is that you use a, an LTI custom parameter uh, you know, called your resource ID or your center ID, whatever custom resource ID, whatever you want to name it, um, and then you use that information, and then you don't have to worry about these uh, the, the actual URLs themselves. Um, so while that's the preferred way, it's still very common and will be to have custom URLs that people actually want to access. And this information comes across in the target link URI, and that happens in both legs of the LTI launch. The first leg, the platform sends a target link URI so that the tool can look at it and just, you know, know whether it's something can even load at all and bail early if it needs to. But on the second leg, there's a claim within the ID token that's called target link URI, um, and it has the full URL of the desired resource. So if this is uh, a legacy application or it's upgraded from LTI 1.1 or the, the vendor preferred to use target link URIs instead of custom parameters, uh, you will need to make sure that you're always looking at the target link URI if that's something you need to use. Now that we're a bit more familiar with how the LTA launches actually work, let's revisit the deep linking messages. So deep linking uh, is a message workflow, so it actually happens in the browser, it's not a service. And how it works is that it adds a couple claim, it adds one claim to the LTI message and it has a different message type. The message type is LTI deep linking request. It's very clear. And then uh, the claim is the deep linking settings claim. And there's a bunch of interesting uh, information in here. Primarily is that deep link return URL that we'll see. When you return to the platform with the content that you've selected, the deep link return URL is the URL you return to. So that's definitely the first thing you need to grab and understand. But other than that, uh, the platform sends a bunch of information to the tool to help the tool present a, a custom UI that the user uh, can take advantage of. So some of those interesting things are accept types. Uh, you know, this isn't just for LTI links. It could be HTML content. It's very common to have images, web links that aren't just LTI links, actual files. You know, there's many, there's many possibilities there. Uh, it also doesn't necessarily have to be something that's only embedded in iframe. You can send back whether you want it to open in a new window, embedded, uh, different things like that. Uh, some platforms can accept more than one uh, piece of content at a time, and so they let you know ahead of time so you can adjust your UI for that as a tool. Um, also, sometimes when you return the content to the platform, uh, it presents the user with everything they've selected, and then the user chooses at that point whether to actually add it, or uh, they might just add it right to the course. And, you know, they're just kind of letting you know what their flow looks like in case you want to adapt your interface to that. So, you know, they just, you know, the launch happens, and this is the data that comes, and then as a tool, you present the interface, and uh, they select something, and this is what you send back to the platform. Uh, you generate your own JWT with a message type, and it says LTI deep linking response up there. Uh, if a platform sent some data along, uh, usually that's just an opaque, as if you see in this example, this is again the request. There's just some random data. The tool doesn't know what that is or care what it is, but the tool is required to pass it, to send it back if it was sent in the first place. Usually it's just contextual information that a platform might need to know where this, this, this content might go. Um, so the response is an array of content items. So these are the, the, the content that the user chose in the UI. And there's a type on these. You know, this is an LTI link. Um, LTI links can also declare line items. Uh, so that basically that means this LTI link is graded. And you can pass them a score, your own custom resource ID, um, and a tag which the platform could use to sort it if they wanted. Um, so there's a bunch of, in the definitions of the documentation for deep linking, you know, there's all these different content types and they show you great examples of what the JSON looks like when uh, the user chooses those. So we see what those look like. Let's look at, you know, one more sequence diagram for today. Uh, you do a normal LTI launch, uh, but the message type is LTI deep linking request and you send that deep linking claim that we just looked at. So it's the same normal LTI launch, just different message type and it adds that claim. So the tool gets that, validates it. Instead of presenting content to the user, it presents 
a search interface, um, you know, or maybe it doesn't even need search, it just knows what they want, you know. So just some interface where the user actually goes select what they want. User navigates there, adds stuff to its cart maybe, or you know, it depends if you're gonna have one or many things. And then once the user is done with that, they submit that in their browser and goes back to the tool. The tool generates the, the deep link response JWT that we were just looking at and signs it with its private key. So now this is a tool signing a JWT instead of the platform. And then the tool uh, does an auto post form. It's just like kind of just like a little LTI launch uh, back to the deep link return URL that it received in the first step here. And with the property of JWT equals the JWT they just generated and signed. And once the platform gets that, they validate it by fetching, potentially fetching, fetching the tools a public key to validate it, or maybe they have it cached, um, and then the, the user has it inside the, the course, um, and they're, they're very happy, obviously. Finally, we'll cover a little bit more in depth how to use the LTI services within LTI. So uh, this all starts with getting an access token to use these services. Uh, the services work on the modern OAuth 2 infrastructure that you know many developers are familiar with because uh, almost all modern APIs use the same mechanism. So uh, the, the first step to getting a token is that when an LTI launch comes across, a service claim is inside that launch message. So each service that is supported by the platform puts a little bit of data in there. And we'll look at those two examples of that. But it goes in there and it tells you a little bit it tells you that the platform supports that service. And so at that point, a tool requests a token from the platform. And at registration time, one of the URLs that a platform provides to the tool is the endpoint for requesting access tokens. Um, and we'll walk through one last sequence diagram of how this flow looks like. But when you request one, you set the scopes you would like, so the permissions you would like for your uh, API token. Uh, the platform then mints a short-lived access token. These generally last, you know, an hour or two, sometimes 24 hours, um, but you should expect it to not be long-lasting. Um, and so a tool should cache these for reuse, but when a tool goes to use it, they should check the expires add on it um, to see if it's expired, and if so, just go get a new one. Or it's possible that when you actually go to use it, the platform will re re respond with response that says it's expired. Um, and that just means the tool needs to go through and request, request a new token. So that should be uh, a part of your implementation is just you know, building around the, the short-lived tokens because those, those will get you. So let's look a little bit closer. Thank you, Martin, for this sequence diagram. We're gonna walk through this really quickly. Uh, so a tool wants to get a token from a platform. It generates a JWT. Uh, and this is a bit different than the, the actual launch ones. You know, we're in kind of more solid OAuth 2 land here instead of OAuth OpenID Connect land. Uh, so this JWT has an issuer, which in this case uh, is the client ID for the tool. Uh, the subject is also the tool's client ID. And then the audience uh, is uh, at registration time, um, uh, you, you get a uh, platform service auth endpoint uh, and that is the audience, but it could be that you also have a specific platform auth provider uh, as well. And so you kind of have to make sure you get the right audience here. There's two possibilities for that. Um, generally, you're only going to have one, but uh, there could be two. The IAT is the issued app, so you just do the now time step. Expires at, you know, this example has now plus one hour, uh, um, and then uh, a random string uh, value for lots. Uh, the tool signs that JWT and then posts to the platform service auth endpoint. Uh, and in that post, um, it has this, this data. This is the grant type client credentials. So that's asking, that means it's asking for an authorization token. Uh, the assertion type looks just like this. It's that specific URL in there. Uh, and this is requesting a bear token because when you use the API, you're going to add this into the authorization header as a bearer token. You put the actual JWT that you generated and signed as a tool into the client assertion uh, property. Um, and then finally, a list of the scopes you are requesting. Uh, you can see some examples here of the membership service. You know, you can have, you know, the membership service is uh, 
uh, has a read only, it has line items, has score. It may be that when you request those, the platform doesn't want to give you all those scopes. So you just request all the permissions you want and the platform will take those into consideration. Uh, you fetch or you, you know, hopefully already have the platform's uh, public key cached and you, um, uh, I, I got that reversed. Uh, <laughs> the, when you send this over to the platform, the platform needs to fetch your public key from you that you use to sign this. Again, that's in the, you use your key ID, the kid in there, the platform will validate this with the tools public key. Uh, and once it validates that, uh, it will mint an authorization token. And so the response has the actual token used uh, that you will use. It has token type bear. It tells you how long it will expire in. So it tells you when it's going to expire. Um, and then the actual scope of that token as well. And you can see in this example, even though the tool requested um, three different scopes, there was only one return. And so they didn't get everything they asked for. So that's something you need to watch for as a tool. You can't assume all the scopes you request will actually be granted to you. Likely they often will, um, but you know, the deployment on the platform, uh, the, the LMS admin can you know, modify what uh, permissions any given tool has. And then later when you actually want to call the service, you put this access token inside the authorization header uh, as a, a bear and token string. So let's see what this, the claim actually looks like. So here's the assignments and grades. This is the claim uh, that gives all the information about the service. Uh, you'll see that the two main things to look at are scope and then these two URLs. So the scope, these are the three permissions I was referencing earlier. Uh, every single launch that comes across that supports assignments and grades will have this claim in it. So as a tool, you can count, you know, you can kind of use this as a cue, like, oh, does this platform even support any given service? You will know because you will see this in the launch. And it even tells you the scopes. They, they might just send you a specific, you know, read-only scope and not the other ones, you know, because they just don't want you to even request those other ones. So those are the scopes that are available and that you'll use when you're requesting an actual token. And then these two URLs are the actual API endpoints you would you will hit when you're using the service. You know, those aren't created at registration time. These might be different in different contexts. You know, they might build in different IDs into these the platform may. So uh, you'll want to remember these actual URLs. So if you want to get um, all the line items, you will use this URL. Uh, if you want to get a specific line item, you use the other one. So it's very important to pay attention to what service claims come across uh, in an LTI launch. Uh, so that's the assignments and grades one. The other one is the names and roles uh, service. Uh, its claim looks, looks like this, and all it has is this context memberships URL, and that is the service endpoint. Uh, names and roles has only one scope to it. And uh, in the specification, it wasn't specified that uh, this claim should always list the scope. And so uh, unfortunately, for consistency reasons, you can't actually rely on the scope being listed here in the claim. And so when you're implementing this, you want to grab this you know, claim from the specification right here and have that on hand in your code to request that from the authorization endpoint, um, because it won't actually come across in the claim. So that's just a small gotcha there to to, to remember. And so that's really the, the high level of how you use the services. Each launch has a claim in it that tells you the endpoints to hit and the scopes, and that implies that that service is available on the platform. And this is a fairly uh, normal uh, OAuth 2 workflow here, and so there's lots of libraries around this, and uh, you probably integrated with many other platforms. So that's the bulk of this presentation. There's a few gotchas. Most of these we've worked in. I've worked into the presentation throughout. Um, uh, one that catches a lot of people is that the ID token, uh, the audience can be either an array or a string. Uh, the practice is if it's an array, you just take the first value. Um, uh, but that you know, especially you know, Java libraries and other more uh, static languages that can that can catch them a bit. Um, and some of these, all these other ones we've really kind of covered other than um, the three ways that a tool's public key can be shared. I mentioned earlier that the JWKS URL is not required um, and there are uh, tools who have not implemented that, though the majority of tools uh, are doing that because that's what the, um, you know, the community's kind of 
wants to use those. So ideally, everyone's using the JWKS URLs. But sometimes a tool might provide a single public key to the platform at registration time, just kind of a copy and paste situation. A lot of platforms don't support that, some do. Um, in some cases, a platform uh, might actually generate the public private keys for a tool and provide that to the tool. Um, but those, both of those patterns are slowly going away uh, in preference for the JWKS URL. So, uh, you know, that's, that's our introduction to LTI Advantage. Um, and hopefully you found this useful. And if you have any questions, uh, again, the IMS website is a great resource. There's links to the forums in here. The actual documentation is here. And there's many, many great uh, videos on the LTA roundtable. So if you have any more questions, please feel free to reach out. Uh, the, the LTI community is very happy to answer them. Thanks.